For context, my mom has always been a little crazy. Never drowned me in the bathtub crazy. Just a little off. Like sometimes, she was living in a different world than the rest of us. Like when she looked at you, she knew in her heart that you were less real than her. I remember being really little and walking into her room to find her crying over a heap of her clothes on the ground. She had scissors in her hand, and she was cutting out every spot of purple she found. I can't see it anymore, Cassie, she said through the sobs. I can't see the colors I'm supposed to see anymore. I went and hid in my room after that. When my dad came home, he found me locked in my room and asked me what was wrong. I explained what had happened with Mom, and he just sighed and went to talk to her. What I couldn't explain was that I hadn't locked the door because I was afraid of her. I had locked it because it felt like an added barrier between myself and the reality that my mother wasn't okay. When they divorced, I don't remember any particular incident that broke the camel's back. It felt more like an inevitable conclusion that we had all accepted for years by the time it finally happened. What I do remember is listening to my dad read off a list of the big crazy moments from their marriage. Some of them were a surprise to me, like him coming home to find her hiding in a closet with a knife. Most of them, though, I remembered all too well. So when the judge looked at me and asked if what my father was saying was true... It was all I could do to nod back at her. Needless to say, my dad got custody of me. Even at 12, I knew that, regardless of his case, there had still been a chance of things not going his way. Afterwards, we went to Sullivan's and ate our weight in ice cream sundaes. I knew that it wasn't easy for him to raise me alone, but I also knew that he was doing his best. My father was a 46-year-old middleware technician when he chose to become a single parent. He worked long hours for little pay, but still found time to tutor me in math and come to my track meets. He was patient. He was gentle. He was my hero. But all of that is just a lead-up to my story, right? It turned out that a few months ago, my mom got in contact with my dad. She said that she was getting treatment, that she wanted to make reparations. She gave him the number of her psychiatrist, who my dad promptly called. The man on the other end of the line assured my dad that his ex-wife wasn't the same person from four years prior. He said that she had changed and that she was getting better. He promised that getting closure with my dad and me was vital to her healing. At first, dad refused. He was convinced that no amount of medication or therapy would change the woman who had haunted him and his daughter all those years. Eventually, though, he met her. He says it was just to get her off his back, to put the final nail in the coffin. Instead, he realized that she really was acting different, more lucid, more stable. They met a few more times, and... With each meeting, he became more and more convinced that she had gotten better, that this time it would be different. When he walked into the house after seeing her, I couldn't tell what he was feeling. It felt like some kind of exhausted hope, the kind that shouldn't still have a pulse, kind of undead yearning. He needed help. I'd known that for years. He was working himself to the bone trying to take care of both of us. When I'd been born, my dad had signed up to be a part-time team member. Now, it was just him and the growing shadows under his eyes. When he gently asked if I wanted to see Mom again, I nodded enthusiastically. Not for her or me, but for him. It is so, so good to see you, sweetheart. Those were the first words she said to me when she sat down across from me at McDonald's. I can't begin to apologize for everything I must have put you through. She looked better. I think after all those years, my memories of the way she acted and the way she made me feel had blended together into a flat nightmare. The woman squeezing my hand wasn't scary. It even felt appropriately motherly, though it made my skin itch. 
We met occasionally for months. We were alone once or twice when my dad had to step out for a work call. When we were, she would tell me about her group therapy, about all the friends she was making. She told me that it took her so long to realize that her biggest problem was self-isolating. It drove me crazy being alone, she said, but it's okay now. Now I'm not alone. Eventually, my mom asked Dad if I could stay with her overnight. He was clearly uncomfortable with the idea and told her that he'd have to think it over. All I could think about was the work retreat, the trips with friends, all the times that my dad had missed out on living his life to take care of me. All for me. And I thought that maybe, just maybe, if I got to a place where my mom could take on even a little bit of the burden, that he might have his life back. So I told him that I wanted to go. I begged him to let me stay with her. Eventually, he agreed. I'll be here to pick you up at seven, he said, as he pulled my suitcase out of the car. He would picked me up from track and drove me straight to the cramped apartment building where my mom lived. On the dot. If you need me before, promise me that you'll call, okay? I promised him, offering a pinky when he gave me a stern look. He locked it with mine and took a deep breath. Your mother's trying, he said. I can appreciate that. I can even respect it. But I will drive my car through a front door if it means protecting you. Understand? I laughed at the image of his scuffed Nissan hatchback smashing through the bricks and the drywall. I squeezed his hand. The evening was fine to start with. Her two-bedroom apartment was neat and tidy, if a little small. It had a smell, too, like the ghost of something rotten hiding in the walls. But she let me put whatever I wanted on the TV. She even brought popcorn and soda for us to eat on the couch while we watched a police procedural. When I heard the oven timer ding, I asked her what she was making, and she stood up to go check on it. It's your favorite, honey. Tuna Mac. I felt the heat drain out of my face just a little. Tuna Mac wasn't my favorite. I don't think I'd ever eaten it before that night. But I told myself to shrug it off. It had been years, hadn't it? It was all right for her to have a little misplaced memory. That alone didn't mean that anything was wrong. The phone buzzed with a text from my dad. All good? he asked. You're such a worry wart, I responded, after giving his question a thumbs up. We ate at the table as the procedural show wrapped up. I felt like we should be talking, sharing, but there wasn't much to say, really. The absence of conversation stretched between us like a typewriter, but we didn't dare step onto it. As I scraped the last bit of tuna mac from my bowl into the trash, Mom told me that she had picked out a movie she thought we'd like. I agreed to it and sat on the couch as she put the disc in. It was a strange movie. Scary, but not in the way that a horror movie is scary. In the way that a nightmare is scary. Like everyone around you knows something that you don't. It followed a woman with amnesia trying to understand what had happened to her. At a certain point, I got a little too weirded out. The strange dream logic of the movie was like a headache I couldn't shake. I pulled out my phone and started to scroll through social media, trying to do so in a way that Mom wouldn't notice. I shouldn't have worried. She was so enthralled by the movie that she was leaning expectantly forward, her eyes full of excitement and hunger. Just over halfway through, however, she suddenly grabbed my knee with an intensity that made me jump. I looked up at her to find that she was still looking just as intently at the TV. Watch this. This part's my favorite, she said. I looked up at the screen to find the main character holding each other in bed, the sexual tension escalating rapidly. I felt my cheeks flush. I, I know how it feels to see a sex scene with your parents in the room, but this one was different. My dad always got a little uncomfortable in a way that made my discomfort feel more normal. He would usually fumble with the remote as he tried to skip through. With him, it was something to laugh about, a running joke between us. My mother's fingers digging into my skin as she commanded me to watch these two women going down on each other felt wrong, though. She shouldn't be touching me. 
shouldn't be encouraging me to watch. She shouldn't have that wild hunger in her eyes. I knew in my head that my mother had never been violent and never tried to hurt me. But with her one hand on my knee, I couldn't help imagining the other one holding a knife behind her back. I felt like I was going to throw up, my throat quickly closing. I, I don't, I don't want to watch this, I finally blurted out. I don't think the words were even all the way out of my mouth before the TV flashed to darkness. The remote was already in her hand, like she'd been waiting for me to say something. Okay, honey, I've got the spare room all made up for you, but before we call it a night, I need to feed my friend's cats. Can you come with me? I wouldn't feel right, leaving you all alone. She held her hand out, beckoningly to me. The hunger was gone from her eyes, leaving just the model calmness she'd had for the last few months. How long will it take? I asked. I'm, I'm pretty tired. Oh, just a few minutes. I, I promise, honey. She looked so sincere that not believing her words would have been like spitting in the face of God. I'd be a bad daughter, a terrible daughter, if I didn't trust her. Of course, I see it now. I see that a person trying to earn back their trust wouldn't act like they had never done anything wrong. A person trying to be better would make allowances for the pain their actions had caused. For her to look at me with the eyes of a mother that had never hurt or scared me should have been the first sign that she was living in a reality different from mine. But I didn't. I couldn't see that then. So I got in the car. My stomach started churning after 15 minutes on the road. I tapped my foot on the interior carpet, feeling the moments of the car trip slip on and on. You said this wouldn't take long, I asked eventually. Oh, silly, she responded. I meant feeding the cats wouldn't take long. No, my, my friend lives a little bit out of town, but we're almost there. Don't, don't worry. She turned the radio up after that a pop station that kept fading in and out of static. I could feel my body trying to take a quicker, faster breath and I tried to wrestle my panic away. I tried sending my dad a quick checking in text as we turned off the highway, but the phone buzzed a moment later to tell me the text could not be sent. By the time we pulled into the snaking gravel driveway, we'd been driving for about 45 minutes and the radio was a hornet's nest of static. To call the place a house was generous. It was a cabin nestled in some deep woods on the outskirts of town, the kind where you can just tell that the owner declined electricity and running water for the sake of independence. Oh, sweetie, they're just going to love you, Mom said as she turned the car off and dropped the keys into the cup holder. Then she got out and closed the door. The cats? I asked, the still warm interior of the car. The inside of the cabin was no better than the outside. When I walked in, my mom was already holding a long neck lighter to a lantern, casting a dim and gloomy light around the place. The rug on the hardwood floor was moth-eaten and ragged. The rotten coffee table looked like it was ready to fall any second. The old couch was gray and muted, and I didn't want to find out if that was sun damage or dust. So, your friend lives here? I asked slowly. I gotta go get some food from the shed, she called cheerily back at me, not answering the question as she stepped out the back screen door. I looked around me. No bowls or cat food. No scratching posts. Not even any claw damage on the old couch. In that moment, standing in the dim light of the strange place, an unwelcome thought popped into my head. The storybook image of Hansel and Gretel being led into the woods by their father so that he could abandon them. She's not going to leave me here, I told myself. That would be crazy. The memory of her cutting the purple from her clothes was my only rebuttal. I listened closely to the silence of the night, sure that I would hear the sounds of feet on gravel, the sound of the engine turning over. Instead, through the overwhelming silence, I heard a shuffle, the creak of a board, the sound of someone trying to stay still, trying not to be perceived. Did she double back? Is she going to try to scare me? Why would she do that? I jumped when the screen door slammed open, 
admitting my mother and a 25-pound bag of dry cat food. Hungry cats, I muttered. Cats? she asked. I saw such genuine confusion on her face that it made my eyes well up with tears. The cats? That's what we're here to feed, right? I said in a small voice. Oh, hungry cats, she laughed. Sorry, I misheard you. Yes, yes, very hungry cats. Hungrier than you think. I helped her move the bag to the porch where she flashed the screen of her phone around until she found a grimy dog food bowl tucked beneath the rotten benches. There we are, she said. She haphazardly tore the bag open and spilled the kibble into the dusty bowl. So, we can go now, I asked. No, sweetie, she said, turning to me with confusion. We have to wait until the cats come to eat. Don't you know anything? Oh, okay, I said, my body beginning to shift and tighten in a way I'd consciously forgotten. The knowledge that the person in front of me was not living in the same reality as me shot through me like pain. The awareness that the wrong word would have my mother ripping my throat out with her teeth shook me. So, um, what's your friend's name? I asked. What do you mean? Her eyes were no longer on me. They were on the tree line, tracing the shadows between the trunks. Your friend, the one who owns the house. Yes, it, it's his house. He doesn't come by much anymore, but he told me I was free to visit whenever I wanted. I just had to feed the cats when I did. She turned to look at me, but I knew that she wasn't seeing her daughter. Her eyes drifted around me like she was evaluating a statue or a cut of meat. I looked away from her instinctively. I traced the same trees with my eyes, knowing that her unrelenting stare was on me all the while. Out of the corner of my eye, however, I caught movement. I concentrated on it. Without looking, I realized that I was seeing the shed where the food had been. The roof had caved in, like the victim of a violent crime. The door was hanging off its hinges. And there, poking out from behind the rotten mass of the shed, was a figure, a gray form against the shadowed backdrop of the woods. It loomed from the darkness like something was curious. I know we might be here a while waiting, my mom said, her eyes still on me. Why don't you go lay down inside? I don't want you telling your father I kept you up all night. Yeah. I said, my voice sounding a thousand miles away. I felt like I was swimming through glass, slow and morbid. Why don't I go lay down in the car? That way, when we leave, you, you won't have to wake me up. No, her voice was stern now, harsh. You'll hurt your back in the car, Casey. Lie down on the couch. But you're my daughter, she shouted, her voice rising in the night air. When I tell you to go to sleep, you'll go to sleep, goddammit. Do you understand? I felt my breath grow ragged, I felt the tears falling, but I was no longer in my body. I was made of clay, soft and moldable, easy to smash and put away when you're done with it. My mom's arms were around me in an instant. It's okay, honey, M mommy's here, she said, like she hadn't been the one to shout at me, even as she led me into the abandoned cabin. Mommy's going to make it better. You just need to lie down, all right? She laid me on the dusty couch and patted my cheek with one hand. Then she walked through the door onto the porch and into the grass. Here, kitty, 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 she began to coo. Kitty, 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 kitty. I needed to get up. I, I needed to run. I needed to get to the car, but my limbs felt heavy and weak. Like all it took was having my mother yell at me for my childhood fears to fall over me like chains. I tried to slow my breathing to regain control of my body. I heard my mother's voice grow fainter and fainter. Was she walking away from the cabin? Was she walking into the woods? That's when I noticed the other sounds. Not the shuffling from before. Not the sound of hiding. The sounds of walking. Of careful, measured steps. I heard the boards creak in uneven rhythms like... Something was slowly dancing, but but it was all wrong. 
I heard the dry rasp of nails on peeling wallpaper. I heard laughter that sounded wet and dry at the same time. Something began moving against the back of the couch, and I stared with half-closed eyes as its shadow fell on the wall. In the outline cast by the dim little lantern, I saw something clamber onto the back of the couch. It perched like a gargoyle, but I could see that it was massive, the size of a man, balanced precariously on the wooden piece of furniture that groaned in protest. The thing above me emitted a low growl, like the rumble of a distant earthquake. I felt a heavy wetness hit my shoulder, and it began to run down my limp arm. I stayed still, not by choice, not because I thought it would keep me alive. In that moment, I, I knew that I was dead, that I would never see my dad again. I knew that I was going to be eaten or murdered or torn apart by whatever was drooling. And since I knew that to be true, I knew that there was no point in running, no point in fighting. It was over. All that was left was to accept that. There you are, you nasty thing. My mom's voice cut through the tension like a flashlight through darkness. Your friends are all out here. Don't worry, you can play with her later after she's had her nap. Through the slits of my eyelids, I watched as the shadow of the figure leapt heavily to the ground. It danced violently into view, spinning in slow, uneven circles before it came to rest on all fours by my mother's feet. It looked mostly human, but the proportions were wrong. The arms were too long, the knees bent at impossible angles. As it followed my mom to the door, it looked back at me. Where the eyes should have been were spheres of black glass. The surrounding skin was mottled and scarred in horrible twisting patterns. As it smiled, I saw that where the flat chiclet teeth should have been were instead sharp splinters of bone that seemed to bleed freely long rivulets of bloody drool spilling onto the hardwood it cocked its head at me the black glass looking into my soul then it leaned its head back inhaled long and deep and followed my mother through the door good kitty I heard my mother say from the porch her voice was drowned out by the sound of dry food being shattered by sharp teeth. The back door, that was all I could think of. That rusted screen door was my only hope of escape. I slid myself off the couch as quietly as possible, my knee landing softly on the tattered rug. I stayed low to the ground and crept around the couch, stepping only on the boards that looked steady. She'll be so excited to meet you, pretty girl, my mom said, still cooing to the thing on the porch. And I know you'll be happy to see her, too. I promised you more wet food, didn't I? Once I reached the screen door, I, I took a deep breath. The door had been loud when my mom had opened it earlier. Looking at the rusty springs holding the door closed, I could only hope that they had been the source. As I put my hands to the spring... A sound from the porch burrowed into my shaking bones. It was somewhere between a howl and a gasp, the sound of air running over broken windpipes, a song I didn't want to hear. It spoke to a deep, ancient part of my brain. It told me to hide. Shaking worse than ever now, I pulled at the spring just enough to pop it off the screw, holding it to the door. Then, my breath still, I pushed the door open and hoped for the best. It didn't make a sound, at least, not over the yowling on the porch. It swung open in silent invitation to the darkness. All that panic, all that fear wouldn't let me be careful anymore. I could see the nose of the car in the carport, could practically taste the dust covering the tires. I couldn't wait. My feet were quiet as I ran through the grass, but the second I stepped onto the gravel of the carport... The porch singing stopped. Cassie, my mother called. Honey, where are you? In moments of true panic, I've never experienced time moving faster or slower, like people always describe. For me, things just start happening all at once. 
In my mind, there's no delineation between the moment I pulled the door open, the moment I scrambled for the keys, or the moment I snapped the car into reverse. They all happen simultaneously, like photographs spinning in open air. As I change gears to drive, however, I remember my mother standing in front of the car. The headlights played across the fabric of her dress. The dust kicked up by the car obscured her and the half-dozen creatures flanking her on either side. And in her eyes, I saw real hurt, a genuine sense of betrayal. What are you doing? I saw her mouth. I didn't answer, in flagrant violation of the three months I had before I could drive a car without a guardian present. I tore down the driveway and away from this madness. I took every curve inadvisably fast, feeling the inertia of the car trying to buck me every time. I drove so fast that the cloud of dust behind me quickly obscured the house from view. Good riddance. I was almost to the main road when I caught sight of the thing out of the corner of my eye. It was one of the creatures, the one from inside the house, loping easily alongside my reckless driving. Its glass eyes weren't looking ahead of it, however. They were locked on me, and as it stared me down with its smile, I knew one thing beyond a shadow of a doubt. I had only imagined that these things were human maybe deformed or mutated, but still human. Even driven insane with pain, a human could be reasoned with, empathized with, on some level. But these weren't humans. They had never been humans, not by a long shot. In that smile gleaming with blood, in the contortion of muscles where eyes should have been, I knew that these were something else. Some other. That wasn't the shape of a human becoming an alien, but of something alien trying to become human. Only, it had gotten the details wrong. I exploded onto the paved road and took off in what direction I thought the highway had been, keeping an eye out for the creature. I saw it pacing along the rooftops, tracking me through the flickering sodium vapor lights. By the time I hit the highway, the thing seemed to be gone but I couldn't be sure. I think that was when I realized that the tears were shattering on my thighs, that I was gasping in air through sobs. So I drove, not towards home, not towards anywhere in particular. I pushed the speed limit, trying to put as much distance between me and the awful, awful cabin as I could. It wasn't until I felt something buzzing at my feet that I thought about stopping. In the chaos, my phone had fallen to the floor. I grabbed at it and saw that I had a dozen texts from my dad and 20 missed calls. My tears changed then, no longer those of an escapee. They were the tears of someone about to be rescued. I pulled into a rest stop and called him, sniffling. I tried to explain, but before I could, he cut me off and asked where I was. I read him the address of the stop. Tell me everything, he said. I could hear him getting into his Nissan. So I did. I told him everything. I know that in stories like mine, the teenage daughter always holds back details so she isn't thrown in a mental hospital. But I didn't even think about that. I told my dad about the movie, about the tuna mac, about mom saying that she just had to go feed some cats. When I told him about seeing the first creature behind the shed, I threw up in the passenger seat. When my dad eventually got to me, I fell into his arms and sobbed and screamed and and shook. My father, the middle-aged IT professional with a bad hip, helped me like he had helped me when I was five. We're going to call the police, he said, running his hands through my hair. We're going to tell them the important bits. She took you to a strange place and made you feel afraid, right? But how? I don't think we can explain the other parts, honey, but I don't think it makes much of a difference either way. I nodded. That made sense. We were halfway back home when the weight of the night settled over me, waves of tiredness washing me away to unconsciousness. I looked at the clock and smiled when I woke up. It was 7 a.m. On the dot, I said, starting to drift away. On the dot, kiddo, just like I said. That was a week ago. 
After we talked to the police, they sent a patrol car up to the cabin for my mom. When they got there, no one was around. All they found was an empty bag of dog food next to a bowl, with my mother's shoes neatly beside it. According to the county records, the cabin's been abandoned for decades. The last owner had died before the turn of the century, and the land deed was split between his children. The police talked to all of them, but none of them have any connections to my mom. They assured us that they're still looking into it, but I'm not holding my breath. Doesn't matter anyway, because we're leaving. The house is already listed. My dad's been doing online interviews for a new job in a new city. He stayed home from work all week, and he called me out of school. We keep the doors locked and the windows drawn. The revolver he normally keeps in a safe is always nearby. As soon as he can lock down a new job, he says we're booking our flights. We're getting the hell out of this town from my mom and from those monsters. In the meantime, we're sleeping in the family room. I sleep on a pullout while Dad sleeps in the love seat. He's watching over me. I can't wait to leave, though, because sometimes, as hard as he tries, my hero falls asleep, and sometimes when he does, and I listen really close to the silence, I can hear that awful, awful singing. And every night, it's getting a little bit closer. Have you ever stared at something so long that somehow time seems to fade into obscurity? What feels like mere seconds in reality has been minutes. Well, me neither. That was until I first saw The Void. I can't explain what it's like or how it feels, but it's something that can only be sensed like when staring at the corner of your room in the dark. You can sense something is there. But you can't see it. You just know. That's how the void makes you feel. The hairs on the back of your neck stand up, while your eyes just gravitate towards it, unwillingly. It all started when my girlfriend got her first apartment. It wasn't anything fancy, just a small one-bedroom in the middle of the city. She was excited, and I wanted to be supportive. So I did my best to show my adulation on her starting this new chapter of her life. I was on a break for the semester and was coming back home. Me and my girlfriend had done our best to make a long-distance relationship work, and both me and her were beyond elated to see each other. But, more importantly, she was eager for me to see her apartment. As soon as I got home, I told my parents, Hi, ate a delicious lunch my mom prepared for me, something I was craving all semester, and headed to my girlfriend's. Arriving at the complex, I was taken a bit back. The place was guarded with security that was armed. They swarmed around the perimeter, guarding the entrance. As I approached closer, I could see the armed guard begin to look me up and down, and before I was able to get a word out, he interjected. Sir, no soliciting. You must leave the premises, the oversized man told me. The demeanor of the guard left me a bit bewildered, thinking perhaps I had the wrong place. I pulled out my phone to double-check the address, and to add to my confusion, it was indeed the right place. Sir, please leave the premise, the giant man once again said. Still confused, I did my best to mutter out a coherent sentence, feeling intimidated by the man brandishing the rifle. My, uh, my girlfriend lives here, uh, Kimberly. I'm here to visit her. She lives in 4B, I told the stoic man, my voice shaken with apprehension. The guard remained silent and unmoving, all while staring at me intently, and several seconds passed by before he spoke. He radioed to whomever was on the other side of the receiver. You're good. Please enter, the man told me, while now brandishing a bit of a smile, or perhaps a smirk. I gave him a little smile, and walked past the guard as I entered the building. Something about the entrance, other than the usual circumstances, felt off. I could hear the most abnormal humming penetrating from the walls. I ignored it and walked towards the elevator, still jovial at the revelation of seeing my girlfriend. Approaching her door, I could still hear the humming engulfing me, as if a giant motor was filtering air. 
I knocked on the door and stood with anticipation. As Kimberly opened, all the worries that had inundated my mind evaporated into a cloud of emptiness, and all my attentions were set on the most beautiful woman in the world, my girlfriend. Hey, Kimberly shouted, while jumping into my arms. I didn't even have a chance to respond. My voice was silenced as she showered me in an endless sea of kisses. She quickly pulled me into the apartment, continuing to chatter on about how she had been and how life was coming into place for her, but mostly she was talking about the apartment. As she walked me around for the grand tour, which only took about a minute, her rant continued on without a pause, and as my mind gradually began to drift a bit, my eyes locked onto her balcony. You got a balcony, I asked, with a bit of enchantment. Oh yeah, I, I forgot to show you. Come have a look, she said, grabbing my hand and pulling me outside. I was a bit disappointed. I was thinking perhaps she had a scenery of the skyline. Instead, it was a direct view into the courtyard, a view she shared with all her other neighbors. I looked around at what seemed to be an endless sea of balconies, staring at all the apartments above and below me was making me a little dizzy. Whoa, I didn't realize the complex was so big. How many floors are there, I asked, astonished. Kimberly just shrugged her shoulders, dismissing my question, and started pointing to her neighbors, gossiping about who she suspected to be a weirdo. My eyes followed her finger, seeing that most of the balconies were vacant of anyone, but we only saw one person. It was a woman just standing still and unmoving like some statue. She was leering down at the courtyard. That caught my attention, since she was positioned in such an odd way. I looked down to see if I could make out what she was seeing, but to my dismay there was nothing. What's she staring at? I asked rhetorically. Kimberly abruptly stopped talking and realized who I was referring to. Huh, I don't know, she told me, practically dangling over the top of the guardrail as she tried to figure out what the lady was gawking at. Damn it, Kimberly, be careful, I said with frustration, pulling her back over. She stared at me curiously. This whole place is a bit weird, isn't it? I mean, what's up with all the security guards outside? I could see Kimberly's charming eyes drop with disappointment due to my criticism her arms grasping at her waist with frustration. So you don't like my place? Thanks. Those guards are here because some politician's kid lives here, or something like that. Honestly, it makes me feel safe, she told me, as she turned to walk back inside. I felt a knot turning in my guts, knowing that I'd hurt her feelings. So I approached her as she was still turning away from me and embraced her, kissing her neck. I'm sorry. It's a great place. I guess it's just weird being back. I don't know. I said as I caressed her tenderly. She turned and looked at me with those enchanting emerald eyes. I could feel my heart skip a beat when she smiled. As night progressed, I tried to brush off the weird encounter with the balcony and just enjoyed myself with the love of my life. As we watched movies, I stayed the night and found it difficult to sleep. I lay in bed staring up at the ceiling as my girlfriend breathed deeply in her slumber. It was, it was that humming. I could still hear it. I got out of bed and walked into the living room, grabbing at my head, feeling an intense pounding permeating. The sounds seemed to be coming from outside. I walked towards the balcony cautiously and slid the glass door open, the moonlight showing the complex in a vibrant blue tint. I stepped out onto the balcony, hoping that the fresh air would relieve some of my anxiety. Instead I was presented with the most frightening sight. The lady from earlier was standing on the same place staring down at the courtyard. "'Ma'am, are you okay?' I asked, directing my words towards the woman. She remained still and unresponsive, the surrealness of the situation sending a chill down my spine. That's when my caution morphed into a bit of terror. Through my peripherals, I noticed that there were now more neighbors on the balcony, all standing in that same emotionless stance. I turned to get a closer look at the others and realized that they, too, were staring down at the courtyard. As I stared at them with disbelief, one man turned his gaze to me, catching me completely by surprise. His expression was riddled with pure terror, defeat engulfing his eyes as they glistened in the moonlight from tears. I could feel him whispering something to me from across the courtyard, and as my brain did its best to put the words together that he was mouthing, I soon realized he was asking for help. I stepped back into the apartment, horrified, 
my retreating away from the moonlight balcony. Hey! I practically jumped in the air like a scared cat, my girlfriend having startled me. What are you doing? Why did you get out of bed? Kimberly asked. I remained quiet for a few seconds, trying to recover my breath as it had escaped me, my heart still beating a million miles an hour. Sorry, I, I couldn't sleep. That, that humming was bothering me on the balcony. Again with the balcony. Just don't go out there if it bothers you so much. What humming are you talking about? The air conditioning? Kimberly asked angrily. I understood that she must have felt I was criticizing her apartment, so I didn't respond. We just went back to bed. The next morning, I went back to my parents' house under the guise of wanting to spend some time with my family. Well, at least that's what I told Kimberly. In reality, I couldn't spend another minute in that horrid apartment. Just thinking about what had happened last night made my skin crawl, and I could feel a wave of relief wash over me knowing I was far away from that place, away from those people. Days passed, and it quickly turned into a week. My mother became curious as to why I was no longer spending time with my beloved girlfriend. I don't get it. Summer's almost over, and soon you'll have to go back to school. Why don't you spend the last week with her? Or did you guys break up? I didn't know how to respond. In all honesty, I hadn't even talked to Kimberly in weeks. In fact, she hadn't even texted me or called me for some reason. That left me feeling a little bit left out. The feeling of being perturbed quickly morphed into one of concern, once I had the revelation of perhaps her neighbors had gotten her. Son, are, are you okay? My mom once again asked, disrupting my deep thoughts. Yeah, sorry mom, I guess I was sort of thinking about how fast the summer had gone by, and you're right, I'm, I'm going to go see her today actually. We had a big dinner planned, I lied. No need to get her involved with this apartment nonsense, I thought. I reached into my pocket to retrieve my phone and nervously search for Kimberly's number. I dreaded calling her, knowing what place she lived in almost as if the complex could sense my fear. There she was, a finger press away from knowing if she was okay or not, but I waited and waited, time clicking ever so slowly as I could hear my mother's footsteps in the background, almost urging me to dial. Click. The phone didn't even ring, it just went straight to voicemail. Somehow, in the back of my mind, I knew what had happened. The place wanted me to go there. It wanted me to rescue Kimberly. As I stood still, lost in my own contemplations, I couldn't explain anything other than divine intervention took control of my limbs. And with haste, I made my way out the door into my car. I was going to save the love of my life. Arriving at the apartment, I noticed the armed guards were no longer present. I didn't see any movement of life outside at all, in fact. The complex was desolated. I could hear that dreaded humming from outside, the sound that was getting louder. I almost regretted my decision to come back to this place, but I had to save Kimberly. I cautiously made my way up to her apartment, and to my dismay, the door was wide open. The apartment was absent of sound or any light, darkness protruding out into the corridor. Kim, are you there? I called out. I breathed in deeply, swallowing my trepidation as I walked into the apartment. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I wandered around, still calling out for Kimberly, and that's when I saw her. She was out on the balcony. She stood unmoved as her body cradled back and forth in one place, as her head was positioned down towards the courtyard. I quickly ran to her, grabbing her shoulders and turning her to face me, but her gaze was vacant. Her eyes glazed over. Kim, answer me. What, what happened? Snap out of it, I demanded, as her tears began streaming down her face. She remained unresponsive, a bit of drool sliding down her chin. She was completely gone, and all I could do was embrace her, crying, wishing that she would come back. That's when I heard her voice. It was calling me, calling me to the courtyard. Kim? I whispered out, utterly confounded. I carefully looked over the balcony, my eyes crawling as it gazed down at the dark courtyard. All the neighbors were still in their same positions. That's when I finally saw it. It was something I'd never seen before, some sort of chasm that glowed. I don't know how I couldn't have seen it before. I'm down here. It's beautiful. Come down here with me, Kimberly's voice told me. 
that humming. It was coming from that void, and now I couldn't look away as I just kept staring into it. Kim's down there. I just want to be with her. I don't know how long I've been staring at it, but if you ever hear a humming, just know it's coming from the void, and whatever you do, don't stare into it. At first, I ignored the dripping sound. I figured it was just raining, but the drip, drip, drip just wouldn't stop. No matter where I go, it's there. I've searched the whole house by now for the source, but no matter where I stand, it seems to be coming from over my head. I called a plumber. They should be here between 10 and 2. I'm really hoping for 10. Sound is driving me crazy. I try to distract myself with music, but no matter how far I turn the stereo up, the dripping is still there. Incessant. Just loud enough to form a backbeat. Drip. 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 The plumber showed up. His eyes are red like he hasn't been sleeping. I explain the problem and he goes to look. Yeah, I've been hearing the dripping for a couple of days now, the plumber says from under the sink. The leak clearly isn't there, but I don't say anything about it. He's the plumber, after all. It says so on his name tag along with his name which i'm certain he told me but i must have forgot the plumber keeps talking i'm starting to think it's some kind of tinnitus because the drippings following me around this drip does that i admit i can't seem to narrow down where it is well it isn't here the plumber says coming up from under the sink his eyes look even redder now i got a few more places to check though I follow him around the house. He weaves a bit drunkenly, and I start to wonder why his eyes are so red. Just my luck. I get a plumber who can't find the drip because he's hitting the bottle of scotch. Been getting a lot of these calls, the plumber slurs. You're lucky we could get you in. Seems like everyone has a leak they can't find these days. Just, just find it, I say. The tapping, dripping, dropping, clanking sound makes it hard to be patient. Maybe that's why the first thing I thought when the plumber dropped to the floor was, I'm supposed to be thankful for this alcoholic showing up. My second reaction is better, as it clicks with me that something's seriously wrong with this guy. I sink to the floor beside him and reach out. I call his name, which I only know because of the nameplate on his chest. I've forgotten his name even as I say it. He doesn't respond. Little pool of blood spreading on the floor from his nose. The next bit happens in a whirl. I call 911 and the paramedics show up. One of them has bloodshot eyes, and I find myself staring at that rather than at the corpse on the floor, because by then, I know the plumber's dead. He hasn't so much as blinked since he fell to the floor. They take the body away and leave me with a little pool of blood slowly congealing on the tiles in my kitchen. When I head to get some towels to clean it up, I pass the bathroom mirror. My eyes look a little bloodshot, too. Probably the dripping. Makes it hard to sleep at night. Though, maybe it's time to pick up a bottle of scotch myself. I'm not usually a heavy drinker, but something to help me relax a bit. The next day, I'm sitting in my living room with the TV blaring in a doomed attempt to drown out the drip, drip, drip. A report comes on the news that catches my attention, mainly because I recognize the plumber's face. The familiar plumber's snapshot is alongside a few others on a screen cap. The details of the report are hard to concentrate on as the drip, drip, drip seems to wind in among the calmly stated facts from the news reporter. But even with that, I manage to get the basics. The people on screen, including my plumber, are all dead. That part makes sense. The rest doesn't seem to compute properly, even with my limited knowledge of biology and how the body works. The findings in his death don't feel right. When they brought my plumber to the hospital to examine him, there was no brain in his head. His entire skull was filled with blood. He was the first. Lucky me to have the first die in my kitchen and leave a pool of blood. 
The others are victims that have come in since his death. All dead now, according to the newscaster, with her perfect lipstick and her wide blue eyes. The CDC has been called in. The newscaster gives a list of warning signs of this new disease. I barely hear most of it, because it sounds more like a practical joke than a real thing. The only thing I really pick up on is the dripping sound. The dripping in my own head wouldn't let me tune that factoid out. Apparently all the victims heard a dripping sound, which the doctor and the scientist are proposed was the sound of blood dripping into their empty skull, filling the place where their brain was supposed to be. I, I turned off the TV and headed upstairs to bed, despite it all just being the middle of the day. People can't live without brains, even I know that. Despite being unreasonably exhausted, trying to sleep as hard with the dripping sound. I can't escape the repetitive noise. I shut my blinds, trying to blot out the sunshine outside and climb back under the coverlet. I find myself mulling over the TV report. It can't be real. How, how could they even know that the people had empty skulls prior to the dripping? Were people coming in to report this to them before dying? And who would have even thought to look for such a thing? Outside the window, the sound of a siren screeches by, fading into a keening sound in the distance. By the time I finally drift off to sleep, I've convinced myself that I imagine the entire report. I dream that I'm trying to find a leak in an old basement that smells like mold and copper. I find blood dripping down the wall instead, and realize I'm standing in a puddle of it. By the time I get back to the basement stairs, it's, it's up to my knees. Morning comes, and the dripping sounds louder, more like the plop of water in a full bathtub than droplets hitting the porcelain. Like, like my brain's filling up. Except that thought comes directly from the news report that I must have dreamed. I go downstairs and turn the TV on again to make breakfast. There's a dried pool of blood in the kitchen floor. I should have cleaned that up. I'm gearing up to do that as I eat some dry toast for breakfast. But the news comes on and distracts me. Pictures of the local hospital and a new set of faces fill the screen. I see a number, but I don't recall the death total a moment later. It must be hard to remember things without a brain, I tell myself. I don't listen to the newscaster's report this time. Instead, I pick up my smartphone and do my own research. The report I heard was real, or at least the report really happened. Lots of people are calling the disease made up and falsified, but I notice that everyone from where I lived is scared. There are more reports of deaths, wives telling what happened to their husbands, children saying what happened to their parents, and every story starts with that dripping that no one else can hear. I do some research on the doctors who are putting in this insane claim. They were all respectable before this, and their reports still chill me in a way I don't expect because... All of them are saying exactly what I thought. This shouldn't be possible. People can't live without brains, but they are. That makes me study the report carefully, searching for the underlying fact, even if those facts contradict logic. The body count's up in the hundreds now. <laughs> Didn't take long. The disease seems like it takes about four to five days in total. Now I'm sure of what the sound in my head is. It's a drip, slow and steady, of blood into my empty skull, filling the space left vacant. Drip, drip, drip. No matter how much I study the report, there's no explanation for this phenomenon, nor why the people die when the empty space is full. But they do, and by inference, that means I will too, unless I can figure out a way around my looming fate. I clean up the dried blood on my kitchen floor, overflow from the plumber's brain. He should have drained it beforehand and brought himself some time. How full is my skull? I'm three days into this awful dripping. I go out to my car and consider driving away, but the dripping would just follow me. When I go back inside, I'm thankful that I didn't leave. The TV tells me that the borders of the city have been closed. We're all in full quarantine for the rest of the world. Another fact sneaks in to frighten me. 
the death toll is up in the thousands now. And that's just the ones that have been reported and tallied. There are only two things the city's doing now. Dripping and dropping dead. That strikes me as funny. And I laugh. I can see my reflection in the kitchen window as night falls. My eyes are a horrid shade of red. I wouldn't mind some scotch, but... Pretty sure that even if there were places open out there, they wouldn't serve me. No one seems to know if this is contagious, but no one's taking any chances. We don't know what the cause of this plague is, but the quarantine has people thinking that it can be contained. That means that we're spreading it somehow. No scotch in the house. I lock all my doors and bar the windows as night deepens. There are bodies in the street can't find a death toll online anymore. No one's doing anything akin to scientific research. I find several places where people outside the city are discussing what's happening. I try to leave comments, but my fingers don't seem to want to type anything sane. I can locate a few like me, typing similar comments. All we talk about is the dripping. The drip, drip, drip but it started to sound like a ticking sound to me. After all, that drip is my life, ticking back to zero. In the middle of the night, I hear a gunshot fired, then another. Someone runs by outside my house, and I'm pleased that they don't fall down and die. There's enough corpses outside my house if, no, when I survive this, I don't want these bodies to be my responsibility. No one out there is going to help me, not those talking about the disease from their safe, unaffected cities, and certainly not the dwindling population of the city around me. I stare at my kitchen floor and think about the plumber. Ending up like him is hardly appealing, so I won't. His problem, I decide, was that he didn't have the information I do. He didn't know what was happening to him, so he couldn't address it. He didn't know that... He didn't have a brain in his skull, and it was slowly filling up. My leg up is that I know these things. I wonder how we lost our brains and if we can get them back. But those are facts that I don't have. The people who came after me may have them, but I have to make do with what I know. And what I know is that my skull is filling up with blood, and I'll die. A smile spread across my face. I feel it stretching unused muscles. All I have to do in order to not die is not let my skull fill up. I head into the garage and dig in the tools there. I find my drill and bring it inside. Safety first. I wash and sanitize the bit. Then I leave my sink faucet on. I figure I can wash and rinse the thing as I go in if it becomes necessary. Good thing I know my sink doesn't leak. I giggle a little. I'm kidding silly. It's all the dripping, I guess. I tell myself it's, it's hard to focus with the dripping, and maybe, just maybe, it's hard to think clearly with no brain. The best place to go in, I decide, is the dead center of the skull. I don't need to worry about hitting my brain, after all. I plug the drill in and, and put the bit where it belongs. I picture the blood coming out of the plumber's nose. Obviously, that doesn't work as a drain before death, but I'm smart enough to create my own drain. My head would never fill up. Nope, I'll just let that pesky dripping blood drain out the front. The back might have been a better choice, not to mess up my face, but I can't properly reach back there. Forehead it is, I guess. I turn the drill on and press it to my forehead, You'd think it'd hurt a lot, but you know, the truth is, it doesn't hurt all that much at all. After the first surprise jolt, it's more like a toothache. Nasty, but localized. And the knowledge it would be over soon kept me going. The drill bit pops through the other side of my skull. I feel it because the resistance is gone, and the drill just slides forward. I pull it out and tipped my head over the sink letting the blood drain out and get washed away by the flow of water. I wonder who else has thought of this, 
as I clean up bone fragments and blood from the kitchen. Then I wander into my living room. I don't turn on the TV. I can't hear it over the dripping anymore. People are screaming outside. I feel sorry for them. I figured it out. I'm safe. But they're still out there. In the worst of it. I go to the window and look out. Peeling back the curtain. The world is fresh and new. Vital. Looks redder than it did before. It's actually a little hard to see. Oh. Should have thought of that. The blood is draining into my eyes. Not dripping now. But there's a lot of red. More than the tiny drips could account for. Can't see anything through the blood drip. Drip. Dripping over my eyes. Sleep paralysis is a devastating condition. When I was seven, I first had sleep paralysis. My mother tucked me in that night. I could remember the citrus fragrance of her perfume. Her scent always comforted me. After she tucked me in, I quickly drifted off to sleep. The night seemed quiet, but the peaceful atmosphere in my bedroom didn't last. I awoke up around midnight. A smothering sweat drenched my small body. I couldn't move my arms and legs. I could only move my eyes and my lips. It took my eyes some time to adjust to the thick darkness in my room. While my eyes were struggling to see, that's when I heard it. I could hear it snorting, a dreadful feeling coming over me when I heard the inhuman sound. I could see someone standing in my closet after my eyes adjusted. It peeked at me from behind my closet door. It stood there for a minute, snorting at me. When it lurched out of my closet, I finally saw its full body shape. Its elongated arms stretched out like tree branches. It was tall, but it had a feminine shape. It looked like a deformed, seven-foot-tall, naked woman. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. It felt like something paralyzed my vocal cords. After this shadowy figure stepped out of my closet, it stood in the corner of my room with its arms out. It would release a guttural snorting sound every few minutes. The sound was sickening. It reminded me of someone hawking and spitting on the ground. I could see this figure. I'm listening to the horrible noises it makes while I'm paralyzed. The moonlight came in through my bedroom window. It illuminated a part of the shadowy woman's arm. Her skin looked like mud. It didn't look burnt, just darker than dirt. All I could see was her one arm stretched out across the bedroom wall, bathed in moonlight. My mind kept trying to figure out what she was. I thought I was looking at a demon for the first time, or possibly the devil. Movements occurred, but not for me. I still couldn't move my body, no matter how hard I tried. It felt like invisible hands were holding my arms and legs down. The movement came from the shadowy woman. I watched in horror as she made a step towards the foot of my bed. She would take one step, and then she'd hesitate for a moment before taking another. Her awkward hesitation sent more chills through my body than her measured baby steps. I knew she was going to kill me if I didn't move. Frustration tortured me just as bad as my fears. I didn't know what this thing was or why it was in my bedroom. I didn't know what it wanted. The scary stories that my dad told me about the boogeyman came back to me. So I had this naked creature creeping towards me while thinking about my dad's stories and how he told me the boogeyman captures children at night and they never come back. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dad. I wanted to move so badly. I wanted to scream. It felt like I was fighting my body. The voice in my mind yelled at my body, telling it to move. The dark woman mocked me with her hesitant steps. She inched closer and closer to the foot of my bed with her arms stretched wide open. A crazy thought went through my head. Since I couldn't move my body, I thought maybe the feeling would be numb. I assumed the creature would viciously attack me but at least I wouldn't feel pain. I could see her long fingernails pointing out to me, and I knew those fingernails would be the first thing to dig into my body. No pain. Please, no pain. This is what I kept telling myself. Just be calm, Miranda. When the monster grabs you, you won't feel it. It won't hurt. Your body is numb, so you won't feel anything. Tears were in my eyes while I was telling myself this. I wanted my mom to save me. I wanted to see my mom's face, and I wanted to smell her perfume. I wanted to call out to my dad, 
My dad told me to never be afraid of anything, and that's what I tried to do. Time was running out for me. My urge to move was so strong that I started imagining that I could move my arms and legs. I thought I could move my arms, but it was just a hallucination. This was torture. Why was this happening to me? I was just a kid. I had just turned seven, and now I was going to die on the day after my birthday? I'll never go to high school, meet new friends, I'll never graduate from college, I'll never get married, I'll never find out what it's like to be a mom. The best thing I could do was close my eyes. I didn't want to see it attack me. I just buried my eyelids behind the tears. I said a prayer that my mom had taught me. My lips and my voice were still useless, so I had to say the prayer in my head. The prayer repeated in my mind. My mom and dad taught me to believe in God. I needed God to save me. My mother always told me I was God's child, and he had angels watching over me. I wanted his angel to save me that night, and I didn't see him. A demon was making its way towards my bed, and God was just going to sit there and watch it kill his child? My young mind couldn't understand what was happening. I thought the dark figure was a demon, a little girl who knew for sure she would die in her bed. More chills traveled up and down my spine when I opened my eyes to see the giant shadow woman standing over the foot of my bed. She changed her position. Before I closed my eyes, her arms were spread out as if she wanted to hug me. When I opened my eyes, she was standing motionless in front of me, her long fingers over her lips. She was telling me not to make a sound. I couldn't make a sound anyway, so when I saw her holding her fingers to her lips, it didn't matter to me. My situation turned upside down when I heard something else. Something unexpected happened. There was evil in my room, but the evil that stepped into my room was not the shadow woman. I remembered hearing news stories about missing children in town. My mom wouldn't let me out of her sight whenever we went to the store. There were reports of a crazed man in a clown costume going around abducting children. The police were searching for him. They couldn't find him, but they found his aftermath. They found two missing children dead in a wooded area. As a child, I couldn't completely comprehend the danger. When you're a kid, you want to play with your friends. I wanted to play with the other little girls in the neighborhood, but my mom would always keep me close to her side. On my birthday, I went to an amusement park, but I couldn't enjoy myself because I would go from being in my mom's arms to being in my dad's arms, constantly being carried around the park like a doll. I hated this smothering, overprotective behavior by my mother. She passed her paranoia to my father, who would normally allow freedom in my playtime. My childhood freedom ended for a little while because of a child-killing bastard. Somehow, the killer entered our home through the basement window. He stayed hidden in our house for two days. This is how he broke into other people's houses, and he would hack into alarm systems and shut them off. Most of the missing children's news reports involved children being taken from their homes in the dead of night without their parents even knowing what happened. A few days later, their children's naked bodies would be found in a nearby pond or in a dumpster. Mothers and fathers were losing their babies to a middle-aged, six-and-a-half, 250-pound psychopath in a clown outfit. We didn't know that the psychopathic clown broke into our home two days ago. We didn't know he was hiding in the basement. I was only a child, so he thought one little girl in the house would be easy prey. He picked the wrong house that night. I heard him creeping down the hallway right outside my bedroom door. His footsteps were quiet, but clumsy. The hardwood floor in the hall would always creak. My bedroom door creaked open, and I saw his tall shadow hunched over in the doorway. I remembered hearing my pounding heart, my eyes shifting between the killer clown and the dark shadow woman. I couldn't believe I was seeing these two nightmarish figures standing in my bedroom. One figure was evil, while the other was good. He was wearing clown makeup, he had a red painted nose, and he wore a pair of sunglasses over his chalky white face. I could see he had a beard, he had a pink afro wig, and he was shirtless. He had an imposing physique, like a wrestler. I also saw a massive tattoo of a wolf's face on his chest. The large butcher's knife he clutched in his right hand immediately caught my eye. Even in the darkness, I could see the knife's serrated blade gleaming. He was so big that he blocked out my doorway. I didn't know what to do. There was nothing I could do, just lay there, helpless. I started imagining that I could scream for help. My imagination was cruel, it seemed. I hated my body for not moving. 
I hated my voice for not letting me scream. I knew I was awake because he spoke to me. Hi there, little princess. I'm your new friend. Your mommy went away and asked me to take care of you. When he said my mom went away, my heart sunk deep in my chest. As he got closer to my bed, I could see something dripping off the knife, and I didn't want to know what it was. When the child killer spoke to me, his voice didn't fit his body. His voice sounded androgynous. It had a deceptively feminine quality. It's terrifying to see a mountainous man in clown makeup talk softly down to you through a teenage girl's voice. I kept thinking about Pennywise from the movie It, but imagine Pennywise if he was shirtless with the body of Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I closed my eyes again when I saw the killer towering over my bed, getting ready to swing down with that butcher's knife at my face. I expected to feel cold, sharp steel slice through my nose, but none of that happened. I shut my eyes, but I couldn't keep them shut for long. The child killer had so much of my attention that I'd forgotten about the shadow woman who was still standing at the foot of my bed. I remembered hearing the man scream out a curse word, and then I heard a snap. I could still make out through the darkness what was happening. I saw the killer clown's arm hanging in another direction. I'll never forget his guttural, blood-curdling scream as it pierced my ears. His scream echoed throughout our home. I thought that even the neighbors could hear him. What happened next made me almost pass out from shock. I saw the dark shadow woman lifting the child killer by the throat. She hurled him into the wall, and a penetrating thud shook my bedroom. I kept hearing the man begging for his life, and he sounded so pathetic. He just kept screaming out, What are you? Please don't kill me, ma'am. But the dark woman had no pity for him. She bludgeoned him with his knife. I watched her break both his legs. She punched him in the chest so hard that I heard bones and chest cave in. I heard his rib cage cracking. After a few minutes, his verbal pleading became whimpering moans of agony. I didn't know that you could break bones in a human body in so many ways. After twisting the bones around in his arms and shattering the bones in his knees, I watched the dark woman raise the child killer off his feet again. She held him over her head before shoving the butcher's knife into his throat, nailing him to the wall quite literally. I never blinked as I stared at what had happened to the killer. I almost felt sorry for the sick son of a bitch. No. Not really, though. The dark lady made him pay for all the children he had abducted. She made him pay for his attempt to kill me. After the violence ended in my bedroom, I watched as the shadow woman moved towards my bed. She stuck out her arms again while moving towards me. It looked like she was floating in slow motion. My heart was still pounding, even when I felt her clawed fingers breezing through my hair. When she touched my face, I could smell a familiar fragrance. It was that citrus aroma from my mother's perfume. I couldn't understand why the shadow figure smelled like my mother. I didn't understand it until later. The shadow woman hovered over me. Her lips stroked my forehead. She caressed my face for a few minutes, and then she vanished when I heard my father's panicking voice coming from downstairs. I didn't want to believe that I saw blood on the killer's knife, but it was blood. It was my mother's blood. That asshole stabbed my mother to death right before he made his way upstairs towards my bedroom. He left my mother's body lying in the kitchen. My father stepped out of the house to get a few things at the store. When he came back home an hour later, he found my mom's body lying in a pool of blood. Her lavender, sleeveless nightgown was soaked in red. My father cried out when he saw her body. I heard him running up the stairs, crying out my name. When he bolted into my room, I was already in his arms before he could switch on the bedroom light. He saw the man's body nailed to the wall and lost his breath. I told him what happened and what I had seen. He couldn't believe it, but he had no choice. He knew that a little girl didn't have the strength to nail a 250-pound man to the wall. My father called the police, and when they arrived, they asked me a few questions. I told them everything. Like my father, they stared at me. A policewoman caressed my face and said, It's okay, sweetie. You had a traumatic experience. Who you saw in your bedroom was just a good Samaritan wearing a costume. None of the police officers believed that I saw a dark shadow woman. They all believed that my trauma caused me to hallucinate. They even told me I might have seen my father killing the man, and I told them my father wasn't in the house. He had told my mother that he was going to the store. I heard him kiss my mom before he left the house. Those cops didn't believe my story. They had tons of sympathy for me, but I wanted my mother more than I wanted sympathy. 
I missed my mom, and I couldn't stop thinking about her fragrance. I found the perfume she wore while moving some boxes around in the attic. That sweet fragrance took me back to that night. I believe the dark figure I saw in my bedroom that night was my mother, a dead version of her. I'm 36 years old now, and I think about my mother every day. I got married to a kind and beautiful man, and we had a son. My little boy is five years old, and he has his mother's hazel eyes and his daddy's dimples. I try to be an excellent mother, and I'm very protective of my little one, just like my own mother was protective of me. Every night I tuck my son in bed and read him a bedtime story. One night, I told him about what had happened to his mom when she was seven years old. He looked scared after I told him the story. My son is afraid of the dark, but I told him not to worry. I told him that his mother's love will protect him and can reach beyond death even. I told him I'd always be there to protect him. I told my baby not to be frightened if he sees a dark shadow woman standing in the corner of his bedroom. I told him she'll watch over him while he sleeps. I also told him not to panic if he wakes up suddenly, unable to move his body. Sleep paralysis is scary at first, but I told my son that his paralysis will be a sign, letting him know that the shadow woman is there to protect him from things that go bump in the night. There was one thing I didn't tell him, though. I didn't tell him that the black shadow woman standing in the corner of his bedroom might be his mommy if she dies the way her mother did. The house was a small, two-story affair, with white siding on the bottom floor and gray shingles on the top. Three windows were facing the street, a large picture window, a small rectangular one above that, and another large window below it. I got out of my car and walked towards the door, knocking twice before it opened. A woman stood there, wearing a blue dress with her hair tied back in a bun. She had bright green eyes that seemed to sparkle when she saw me standing outside her house. Hello, she said cheerfully. Her voice was soft, but carried well through the night air. Hi, are you Miss Tanner? She nodded. Yes, I am. She smiled again and stepped aside so I could enter the house. It smelled odd inside. Not bad or anything like that, just strange, like old books and dust. Please come in. I entered her living room. It wasn't much more than a couch and a coffee table, an end table with a lamp on it. That's all I really needed for a place to sleep. The walls were painted yellow, which looked nice against the dark furniture. The carpet was black and covered most of the hardwood floors. There was a small kitchen off to the side of the living room with a sink, a stove, and a fridge. Everything was clean and tidy. Sorry for the mess, she said, while pointing to some boxes stacked in the corner. My husband died last year, and I just haven't had the time to get around to moving everything yet. No problem. I don't mind sleeping in a bit of mess. She chuckled. Well, if you want to put your things away, feel free. Just make sure not to take too long, since I have to leave in a few hours. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'll be right back. She disappeared down a hallway. As I looked around the room, I noticed something else odd about the house. The walls weren't straight. They bulged outward here and there like they'd been pushed from the inside out by someone, pushing their way through them. It was subtle enough that it didn't bother me at first, but as I looked closer, I realized that it wasn't just the walls. Every single surface in the entire house had these little imperfections, including the ceiling and the floor. I heard footsteps coming down the hall and turned to see Miss Tanner returning with two glasses filled with water. She handed me one and took a seat on the couch across from me. So, what brings you out this way? She asked as she sipped her drink. I'm looking for a friend of mine. He went missing in the area about a month ago. Oh, that's dreadful. What happened? He just vanished. I paused as I thought about how to explain. He was staying in an abandoned hotel nearby and never came back. We think he might have gotten lost in the woods. She shook her head sadly. That's awful. Is there any chance he survived? Maybe ran away somewhere? I don't know. I hope so. She sighed heavily and leaned back on the couch. I'm sorry. I wish I could help you find him. We sat quietly for a few moments before she spoke up again. I don't mean to pry, but are you sure he isn't still alive? Maybe he's hiding somewhere or something? Well, 
Maybe, I said hesitantly. Do you have any idea where he might have gone? I'm not sure, but I have a hunch. She laughed softly and shook her head. Well, let me know if you hear anything about him. I'll keep my ears open as well. Thanks. I better get some sleep now, I said, standing up from the couch. Of course. I'll show you to your room. I downed the glass of water and placed it on the table. Even that seemed crooked. Thanks again for letting me stay here. You're more than welcome. Please feel free to use anything in the kitchen if you need anything. I will. I followed her down the hallway to a staircase leading to the second floor. At the top of those stairs was another hallway that led to three doors. One on each side and one at the end. She pointed to the door on the left. That one's yours. No one else is staying this weekend, so other doors will be locked. She opened the door to my room and flicked a light switch. There was a dresser opposite the bed with a window above it and a small bed with a nightstand next to it. The wall behind the bed was covered in posters of famous horror movies, slasher flicks mostly. This should be all set up for you, she motioned towards the bed. Make yourself comfortable. My room is on the third floor if you need anything. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. She walked over to the door at the end of the hall and closed it behind her before disappearing into her own room. I took a look around my room before lying down on the bed. The sheets were clean and smelled nice, but I couldn't tell whether they'd been washed recently or not. As I got under them, I noticed something strange about them. They felt heavy, like they were weighted down on one side. When I tried to lift them up, they wouldn't budge. I rolled over on my back and pulled at them, but still no give. Something was definitely wrong with this place. I lay there staring at the ceiling for a while before drifting off into a deep but restless sleep. I woke up sometime later to a knocking on the other side of my door. I sat up and rubbed my eyes before standing up from the bed. Who is it? I called out, walking over the door. There was no answer. I unlocked the door and cracked it open. It was dark outside but the moon was bright enough that I could see everything clearly. I stepped out into the hallway and saw nothing except darkness. Hello, I called again, but once again there was no response. Is someone there? I asked as I turned around slowly. I heard another knock from behind me and spun around only to catch sight of Miss Tanner standing in the doorway to her room. Her hair had fallen loose from her bun and hung down past her shoulders. She was wearing a white tank top and blue pajama pants with red stripes down them. She looked like she was trying to hide herself by covering her face with her hands, which were pressed against her cheeks. Miss Tanner? She didn't say anything, continuing to stare at me with wide eyes. Are you okay? I asked as I approached her. She nodded, but kept her head down. What's, what's happened? I asked as I reached out to touch her shoulder. She flinched away from my hand and backed up until she hit the wall behind her. Then, without saying a word, she ran down the hallway and disappeared into the shadows. I stood there for several seconds, dumbfounded by what had happened. What the hell had I just witnessed? Was it real? Or was it just one of those dreams or hallucinations brought on by stress or exhaustion? I went back inside my room and locked the door behind me. I grabbed my phone from my pocket and checked the time. It was after midnight. I'd been asleep for hours. I sat on the edge of the bed and stared at the poster of Friday the 13th hanging on the wall above the desk. Why would Miss Tanner act like that? And why would she try to hide from me when I touched her? It made no sense. I sighed heavily and laid back down on the bed. I wanted to go back to sleep, but I knew I couldn't fall asleep now. Not until I figured out what was going on here. Maybe if I waited long enough, she'd come back out and explain herself. I must have fallen asleep eventually, because suddenly I was shaken awake by someone pounding on the door. Wake up! I jumped up from the bed and opened the door to find Miss Tanner standing in front of me, with her hands balled into fists at her side. W what's wrong? Get dressed. You, you have to leave right now, she said frantically as she began to pace back and forth. Why? You don't know how dangerous this place is. Get your things and get out, now. What are you talking about? She stopped pacing and looked me dead in the eye. The house is cursed. What? It's haunted. There are spirits in this house. I laughed nervously and shook my head. There aren't any ghosts here. 
Then what do you call that thing you saw earlier tonight? I don't know what you're talking about, I lied. Was she talking about herself? I'm not leaving until I get some answers. Please, just go. If you stay here much longer, something bad will happen to you, just like your friend. My friend? Just go, she yelled. She started running downstairs. Wait, I shouted after her, but it was too late. She was already halfway up the steps before she turned around and glared at me. Tell me what happened. He died, she said simply. How? They got him. Who? The monsters. I blinked at her and tried to process what she was telling me. Monsters? Yes, the monsters. They came through the walls and they took him away. Are you insane? I screamed at her. There's no such thing as ghosts or monsters. She frowned at me and shook her head. There are more things than just that. Then she pointed to the floor below us. You need to leave, right now, before they come for you next. I can't leave. My friend might be here somewhere. He could still be alive. She let out a frustrated sigh and walked over to the window. She pushed aside the curtains and looked outside. The moon was bright enough that I could see everything clearly. I followed her gaze out the window and saw nothing except for darkness. She pulled open the window and leaned out into the night air. He's leaving. She called out into the darkness. I heard a low growl coming from what sounded like inside the walls. Miss Tanner slowly backed away from the window. Then, without warning, she fell backwards onto the ground. Her body hit the floor with a sickening crunch and didn't move again. I stood there, staring at Miss Tanner's broken form lying on the floor for several seconds, before turning around and sprinting down the stairs. The whole house began to creak and moan, and it appeared as if the walls were closing in on me. I ran past the kitchen and the living room, both of which appeared to be untouched, and headed towards the front door. The only light came from the moon shining through the windows of the hallway. As I approached the exit, I felt something grab hold of my shoulder and pull me back. I spun around quickly to see a figure standing in the shadows behind me. It was tall and thin with oily skin and long black hair. Its face was covered by a mask made of human bones. I struggled against its grip, but couldn't break free. The walls looked as if they were melting, and more human bone-masked faces were emerging from all around me, surrounding me on all sides and closing in on me until I couldn't breathe. I reached out to touch one of them, but only grabbed hold of empty air. Then suddenly, I was dragged back through the walls, felt myself descending into that pitch-black abyss beneath me. I woke up gasping for breath and sat right up in bed. My heart was racing and my body was soaked with sweat. There was a loud bang on the door and I jumped out of bed. I unlocked the door and opened it slightly, just enough to see who was knocking. But when I did, I wasn't surprised to see Mrs. Tanner standing there with her hands balled into fists at her side. Get dressed. You have to leave right now.